So at 1 p.m. on November 13th, within one hour of police arriving to the house, a vandal alert, because the U of I mascot is a vandal, was sent out regarding a, quote, homicide on King Road near campus. Now, the alert advised everyone to shelter in place, and then an hour and a half later, a second alert was sent out saying that police didn't believe that there was an active threat and people did not have to shelter in place, but that they should stay, quote, vigilant. And I just wonder why they said this, because I remember reading this in the news the day after this happened. And, you know, assuming the no active threat meant that they knew who committed the murders or that the killer was dead. But that is very much not the case. So did they originally think it was? I mean, I think probably they're seeing the scenario in which uh, the killer doesn't appear to be on that property anymore. And maybe in their minds, they're thinking, okay, you don't need to shelter in place, but just keep an eye out. So like we said before, this was just days before Thanksgiving break. So students began leaving campus early and professors canceled classes due to the growing fear both on campus and just in the city of Moscow. Three days after the murders, it was released that all four victims were murdered with a, quote, edged weapon such as a knife. Now, we will post photos of what is believed to have been used, but basically it looks like a hunting knife of sorts. Yeah, kind of like a buck knife. Yeah, and as various news stations have speculated, it actually looks a lot like the knife that's used in the Scream movies by Ghostface. Now, at this point in the investigation, you know, three days in, Police announced, quote, We cannot say there's no threat to the community, and as we have stated, please stay vigilant. Report any suspicious activity and be aware of your surroundings at all times. Within a week of the murders, the Moscow Police Department received nearly 650 tips and had already conducted 90 interviews, and still they had no viable suspects nor murder weapon. And actually, I want to mention, too, another survivor in the house was Kaylee's dog, Murphy, who is now being uh, being taken care of by her ex-boyfriend, Jake, the one she called numerous times in the middle of the night, which I am also extremely curious about considering these calls, you know, would have been made right before or during the attack. So are these calls connected in any way? And also, this makes us wonder if the dog barked, like where Murphy was during the situation and how Murphy was found, but it has not been made public yet. And I'm sure police did their due diligence as far as questioning Jake about where he was that night, what he was doing. Well, especially since she called him, absolutely. Right, and when he received the phone calls. But yeah, I do think it's kind of weird that, you know, in the middle of the night, she's making numerous calls to Jake, Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden these murders occur yeah. around that same time. Yeah, unless she was just, you know, under the influence and she just wanted to call him because that would have been, you know, around 45 minutes-ish after she got home. So maybe she was just trying to talk to him. Like, who knows? It could not be relevant, but sure. it did yeah. happen. So the only information regarding the crime scene that has been released is that there was, quote, lots of blood on the walls. And the location of where each victim was stabbed and how many times has not been made public. But like we said, too, we do know there's been so many people picking apart just by looking at photos and videos because they all were on TikTok and just looking at the Zillow link for their house and comparing photos of them to the bedroom photos. Like everyone's trying to determine where in the house each of them oh, yeah. were. And people are, yeah, people are really digging in at this point, but it's also hasn't been confirmed if they were actually killed in their beds. Though the coroner did say that it's inaccurate that they were all killed in bed. As we mentioned before, the house is split up in a very weird way, and it's been reported that Dylan and Bethany's rooms were on the ground floor. So, did the killer enter through the second level? The patio that connects to the kitchen is separated by the uh, sliding glass door that we mentioned earlier, and there's also a small area of woods behind it. And when we say woods, obviously, like we mentioned earlier, we're not talking about like a giant forest, we're just talking about um, some large trees that are behind the house. If this sliding door was left unlocked, the killer could have entered and killed Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan on the second and third floors, leaving Dylan and Bethany alive on the bottom floor. 
Now, we know that Maddie's room was one of the two on the top floor, so the third floor, because there's an M in her window next to a pair of pink cowboy boots on display, which she owned. So if you're standing in a certain angle of the yard, you would know that that was her room. And it seems that Kaylee's was also on the third floor, while Xana's room was on the second floor just off of the kitchen. And there was also a vacant bedroom on that floor as well. Now, in a photo of the house during this investigation, a screen from one of the vacant room's windows is on the ground. So did the killer enter the house through this window that was unlocked, or was the screen already off anyway, and they entered in a different way? The front door on the ground floor is the one with the keypad, but with Bethany and Dylan having their rooms on that floor, it makes sense that the killer could have entered from the upper level and left the ground floor alone altogether. Now, either this or Kaylee, Maddie, Xana, and or Ethan was the target. Police have released that they believe that this was a, quote, isolated, targeted attack, but haven't given much other information as to why they think that. So many are running with this idea that 21-year-old Kaylee was the actual target. And this is how Aaron Snell, the communications director for the Moscow police, responded. Quote, there were survivors of this. And then as well, based on the evidence internally at the scene, that has led detectives to believe and continue to believe that this was a targeted event. And of course, we understand that police have to keep the integrity of the investigation, which is why such details have not been released. But it really just makes you wonder what the hell they're talking about. Like, if they believe one or more people in the house were targeted, there must be something that was either left at the scene or just the potentially brutal nature of the crimes itself that are making police say this. And I would assume that there were brutal in nature anyway, because there's actually a photo of blood seeping out of the second story. It's either coming like from a pipe or the bottom of the wall. And I think this was Xana's room. And since it's not too graphic, we will post it because the photo also leans further into the idea that the murders happened only on the second and third floors, which I think we can pretty much confirm at this time. Yeah, I think so. So Kaylee's father, Steve, told CNN that police told him that there was only one person being targeted amongst the four that were killed, though he didn't tell Steve who this person was. He also mentioned that the killer had allegedly done a sloppy job and had left behind an abundance of evidence, which will hopefully lead them to the killer's identity as soon as possible. There are also talks of a possible stalker, which it seems is why people wonder if Kaylee or Maddie were specifically targeted and the others were killed either because they responded to the sounds of the attacks or the killer entered the wrong rooms. Aaron Snell with the Moscow police also stated, quote, we continue looking into the stalker issue and are asking for any information from the public on this topic. Police also stated just days ago, quote, Kaylee mentioned having a stalker, but detectives have been unable to corroborate that statement. Investigators are requesting anyone with information about a potential stalker or unusual instances to contact the tip line, which we are going to put in the end of this episode. In a separate statement, they said, quote, Investigators have looked extensively into information they received about Kaylee Gonzalez having a stalker. They have pursued hundreds of pieces of information related to this topic and have not been able to verify or identify a stalker. So, so many people were saying, oh, Kaylee was the target, at no fault of her own, obviously, but there has been, or at least police are not releasing that they have found a connection to her actually having one or why why it's said that she had one. Yeah, it seems like this is just speculation at this point. But it's also possible that there's no trace of a stalker. Like maybe Kaylee told some of her friends, oh, I've noticed someone's been following me, but there's no like digital footprint, you know, things like that. that yeah, could she doesn't actually... have a name or yeah, a description. Really. Exactly. It might just, might just be something like that. Like I feel like somebody's watching me, but doesn't know who it is. So a University of Idaho student and fraternity member who bartends at the corner club where Kaylee and Maddie spent the night before named Corbin believes they were targeted by an outsider stating, quote, 
They were college girls. They have stalkers. Okay. But you'd never think anyone would go this far. Whoever did this is not in their circle. It's going to be a stranger who saw these girls on campus or outside at a bar and possibly followed them home. And he also mentioned that with a knife as the murder weapon, the suspect may be an experienced hunter or an outdoorsman. I don't know about you, but I feel like Corbin's like concrete answers feel very suspicious to me. Like the fact that he is in an article with his opinions on, oh, this is the person who did it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's just looking at it logically. But yeah, maybe he know. Maybe he recognizes them and knows them, and they come in and he's sure. familiar. Sure, but I do agree. I mean, I do agree that whoever this killer was possibly saw Maddie and Kaylee as vulnerable victims who tried to follow them home. And actually, a former FBI profiler named Jim Clemente believes that the killer is a quote younger man who uh, killed for his first time that night, stating quote. This is an extremely risky crime for the offender, unless he knows one or more of the victims, or he's been stalking one of them. Going into an occupied dwelling with six young adults, any of whom could have had a knife or a gun or a cell phone to call the police, is extremely risky, unless you know the circumstances inside. He doesn't mind the wet work of getting his hands dirty, and his profession will probably say the same thing. He also went on to say that they would have been comfortable with blood if they carried through with four whole murders, and that this person could work as a butcher or be a hunter, as Daphne had just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, for those who don't know, a lot of people in Idaho and just the Pacific Northwest in general hunt. So this isn't some like smoking gun. This is a pretty common activity, which just makes this whole situation harder. Right. And when we lived in Boise, there were a lot of people who were into hunting and fishing there, but even more so up north because it's more isolated the further north you get in Mm, Idaho. Lots of wilderness. Yeah, lots of wilderness. So probably a lot of hunters. Jim Clemente also added that he believes the attack was targeted, though the killer, quote, may not have known which room exactly the person was going to be in. They may have stopped at four victims because they got their intended victim. I don't think he's an experienced killer. I don't think that this guy's done this before. He was likely motivated by revenge or rejection or some kind of insult. Which is why I wonder if the hooded guy in the video was questioned because, I mean, the bearded guy, I hate that we don't have names. I'm sorry, I know the hooded guy, the bearded guy is really confusing. But the bearded guy who told the story said to, he said, believe me that this seemed like a nice guy who had good energy. But the girls did leave him that night. So like, was he a friend they drunkenly left without thinking about Or was this someone they wanted to get away from? And then maybe he came back in anger because as we know, this guy did, I'm I'm not saying this guy did it. I don't know shit about this guy. I'm just saying that it's really suspicious to me that as soon as he's noticed that they left without him, he storms off all the way. I keep saying all the way down, but if you see the video, you'll know what I mean. Like he walked completely out of view and maybe followed them. Who knows? Who knows where this guy went? Yeah, it looks like he just, you know, walked down the road. Yeah. Like, in the same direction. And, I mean, well, not the exact same direction. No, 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 no. Because they went off to the left, and he went straight back. Yeah, so it almost, like, if this was the case, it almost looks like he could have, like, flanked around them. If they went to the left and he went straight Uh and then cut to the left. But they were getting in a car so it's not like they walked off and he could have followed them. He would have had to have followed them in his car. Sure, sure. So unless he saw which car they got into, it would be hard to track them. Unless he knew where they lived. Right? Sure. And I mean, hopefully police have received tips regarding this supposed stalker's identity or they will soon. But the problem here as well is that The killer got a pretty decent head start since the bodies weren't discovered until seven to nine hours after the murders took place. And with classes being canceled, if they were a student, their absence the next day at school, if they did flee, would not have looked suspicious. Yeah, I mean, everybody was going home for the holiday. Yeah, and then they could have done the same thing, gone home to see their family. But since this case has been all anybody is talking about, I mean, even like I said earlier, all of our friends and family at our Thanksgiving dinner discussed it. Like you would imagine the same would go for the killer's family, if he has a family and if he is a young man. And maybe, you know this family senses that their son did it and aren't saying anything. I mean, there's so many possibilities 
Or maybe this person isn't close with their family and they stayed in town. Like there's just the possibilities are endless when you have as little information as we do. But as of the day that we're recording this, which is Monday, November 28th, 2022, today's school is officially back in session for day one of the return from Thanksgiving break at the University of Idaho. So for all the people that police have been unable to question due to them leaving from fear of the killings or for the week-long holiday break, they now will be able to. However, the school is also offering for students who, you know, maybe don't feel safe returning to campus, that they can stay home or wherever they may be and complete the semester online. So it's possible that the killer, if they're a student, won't be coming back to the area anyway. And although police keep saying they believe it's a targeted attack, they're also exploring other options that this could be a serial killer and someone who has killed before but maybe in different areas. Like they were even comparing the murders to a double stabbing in Pullman, Washington in 1999, as well as to a double stabbing in Salem, Oregon in 2021. But they just ruled that out yesterday on Sunday, November 27th. And since there was evidence left at the scene, the Idaho State Crime Lab is officially prioritizing testing on it. And as we know, evidence can sometimes take many months to test because of the backlog, but this case has taken a front seat. And to my knowledge, I've not seen that happen in a case where they, they prioritize DNA over other DNA well, like in seems, other cases. Right. And it seems at this point that time is really of the essence. They, they need to be able to get this done as quickly as possible. Yeah. Cause of, and there's so much pressure from the community, from the media, from the world. So I, I definitely understand it. And if, you know, this person's on the loose. Are they going to strike again? Who knows? Yeah. And it goes without saying that the city of Moscow is completely terrified right now. As some students return to school and other residents make sure that they keep their doors locked at all times and stay inside together after dark. And reports of suspicious activity in Moscow have uh, skyrocketed as a result of this fear. Like, for example, the owner of a local laundromat called 911 last week to report a quote, mark of blood inside the building, though the responding officer didn't take a report. And a woman called police a couple days later at night to report that someone kept shining a light in her window and was repeatedly banging on her door. And then just a couple days before this episode comes out on the night of November 27th, a young woman awoke to find her front door wide open, but she and her th uh, three roommates were unharmed and this happened at 3.18 a.m. And she lived just one block from Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie's house. Aaron Snell with the Moscow police stated, quote, There have been scientists working 24-7 in the lab to try and get back some of those results in quick order. So while there's other cases going on, this case is a priority. And we're starting to get back some results. And this was just a few days ago, so there could be a lot more information coming out this week. And as it does, we know many of you will be reading about it, but we will do a second episode on this when a good amount of new information is available. And they believe that the evidence that's being tested will help create a full picture of the scene and how the murders unfolded that morning. If you have any information that could help this investigation and bring answers into the murders of Kaylee Gonzalez, Maddie Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, please call the tip line at 208-883-7180 or email tipline at ci.mosco.id.us.